province against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Welcome, everybody, to End of the Age. I'm Dave Robbins with End Time Ministries, and I want to thank you for joining me today on Thursday's edition of End of the Age. I hope you all are having a great afternoon. It's about 100 degrees here in Dallas, so if you're somewhere where it's 50, uh, I envy you, but coming this winter, winter, you'll probably be envying us. So I hope you all are having a great afternoon and uh, that the Lord is keeping His hands upon all of you as we pray every morning. I'm going to talk today about a very interesting subject uh, that's going on in America today. And, you know, if you're not careful, you get so far in caught up in so many issues that you really can't see the forest for the trees. You get crowded in so much and everything's coming at you from every different direction. And unless sometimes you step back and look at the big picture and really see what's going on, you really can't, you, you, you can't even form an opinion on what's really going on in the United States, around the world and different things. And that's where prophecy really helps us. It gives us direction. It lets us know what's coming in the future. lets us know what to watch for. And some, I'm going to be talking about a very, very interesting subject going on uh, in America today, an agenda that's being pushed. So I know that um, although some of you have already made up your mind who you will vote for, in November. Most of us pretty much already know who we would vote for coming up. But some are watching the Republican convention and will watch the Democratic convention speeches this coming week trying to make that final decision. Well, of course, myself, I always look for the biblical and the prophetic significance of each candidate and their party, and then I endeavor to make a decision. And so I go and do all the research. What's, the, what's all the big issues that they have? Uh, what, you know, some of the, the major ones. And I go read the, the different platforms. Have you ever went to the Democratic platform and the Republican platform and tried to make a decision off of the issues and really read what they say? Or are you just watching their speeches? Or are you just watching their debates? Well, I would encourage you, as important as this election is, coming up in November, Go and read and educate yourself on every specific issue to make sure you make a, a number one, a, a, um, a prayerful decision, and number two, a very educated decision. And look at their background. What have they done in the past? If they say they're going to create jobs and they've never created one job, you kind of got to scratch your head. You look at, what the, look, at their, look at their track record. What have they done? And over the years... And then say, OK, now that's the candidate for me. And so um, there are several things that would weigh in a decision. Well, one of the big issues for me, as I watch the speeches and the debates and I read about the issues, among of the many, um, there's so many issues. One of the big issues for me personally is the biblical stance on marriage and family values. I like to look, how's their family made up? What do they believe? What have they done in the past? What do they stand for? Now, sometimes that's like trying to look in a crystal ball. I totally understand that. But you, you really need to do your history, your research. Go find out what they've done in the past. Look at their history, um, things they voted on in the past. And also, I would encourage you this year, very important, go read the Democratic uh, platform and the Republican platform. Look at all the issues and see what they believe. Very, very critical uh, in the election coming up. It's very, very important. So in tying all that in with family values and their stance on marriage, there are massive efforts in America right now to diminish the traditional biblical relationships of a marriage between a, one man, one woman, and to advocate alternative lifestyles. There's a huge effort on today. 
Well, on today's program, I want to update you on further efforts to push the LGBT agenda in America and the prophetic significance of these decisions. It's very, very important because we know we're in the last days. We can prove that so many ways. And yet, I'm going to talk to you about one of the specific ways that we can prove it on today's program. So the Bible says it will be like this prophecy in the last days. It's found in Luke chapter 17, verse 29 through 30. And it states, But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. You say, well, what, what does that mean? Well, it's obvious. Rampant homosexuality and perversion, which was prevalent in Lot's day, the Bible says just as it was in Lot's day, that's how it's going to be in our society in the last days. Well, let's look at it. How is that? Well, in 2007, California passed a bill requiring California public schools to positively portray homosexuality in a positive light. It was Bill SB 777, and it effectively banned using the terms mom and dad and husband and wife in the classroom. Remember, I talked, I talked to you about, said earlier, <clears throat> that they were trying to do away with the, there's a, there is a huge um, uh, attack on traditional marriage between one man and one woman. Well, in 2007, California passed this law that um, was against the terms mom and dad, husband and wife in the classroom. Well, it also granted the right for boys to use girls' restrooms and locker rooms and vice versa if they so choose. Well, it banned anything being said or studied that could be interpreted, and I remember this is in the school, that could be interpreted as negative towards homosexuality, bisexuality, or transgender lifestyles. So in practice, the law, SB 777, requires the indoctrination to accept alternative lifestyles. Teaching our children, our kids, uh, all the way up in school, to accept these lifestyles as normal. Any materials that portray marriage as only between a man and a woman would become illegal. Well, recently, just a few days ago, the California Board of Education voted to include homosexuality in the lessons, now get this, from second graders all the way up. It comes from the Christian News Network, and this is Sacramento, California, and it states the California Board of Education has voted unanimously to comply with a state law requiring homosexuality to be incorporated into history and social studies lessons from the second grade all the way through 12th grade. In 2012, California lawmakers passed the Fair, Accurate, Inclusive, and Respectful, or FAIR, Education Act, which requires the inclusion of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Americans in history lessons. Last Thursday, following four hours of testimony, the Board of Education agreed to implement the curriculum in compliance with the 2012 law. An outlined curriculum introduces the concepts in second grade, and we're talking seven-year-olds, with discussions about diverse families, and again in the fourth grade with lessons on California's role in the gay rights movement. The proposed outline also touches on the topics in fifth grade and eighth grades and, and then all the way out throughout high school. Teachers will receive training on how to educate students about homosexuality in American history. Homosexual advocacy groups obviously cheered the development as being beneficial to students. I don't know how they could come up with that. It allows all students to think critically and expansively about how that past re the past relates to the present and future roles that they can play in an inclusive and respective society. But others expressed concern and notated that parents will likely be uncomfortable about the teaching as well. I would be, and I hope that you would be as well. Certainly some families will be concerned about their second graders learning about two mom families, 
But I think parents would be much more alarmed if they knew that LGBT History Month in the past few years has promote, promoted the notion that America the Beautiful is a source of lesbian pride. That came from Matthew McReynolds of the, of the Pacific Justice Institute. And then it goes on to state that California has decided to include people in the curriculum and celebrate them based solely on their sexual behavior. That came from Jane Robbins of the American Principles Project. And she also lamented that, especially after the Obergfell decision, which legalized same-sex marriage in all 50 states, it's only a matter of time until this propaganda spreads to public schools and other states as well. So before I talk about this, there's a second article by the National Review that actually provides a little bit more in-depth explanation because this is huge. In public schools in California, they're going to start with seven-year-olds, second grade, all the way through 12th grade, and they're going to start talking to them about the alternative lifestyles of the LGBT movement in a, in a positive light. Well, these seven-year-olds, they don't know which ends up at that point. Think about the bet when you were in second grade. Did you know how, whether you are male, female, this, that, and I knew. But if, if the teacher started teaching you about all kinds of different things, you're forming all kinds of opinions when you're seven-year-old. And so this next article states that seven-year-olds in California are going to be given the right, that they feel that that's the right age to begin learning about the LGBT history. These lawmakers in California decided that, and the school boards decided to, hey, we're going to go along with that. So new guidelines aim to help seven-year-olds locate themselves and their families in history. So that's helping them locate themselves as well. A seven-year-old. Last week, the Los Angeles Times reported that the California State Board of Education voted unanimously to include study, the study of contributions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Americans in history and social science classes. The LGBT-focused content will be taught in elementary, middle, and high school grades. Teachers will give students, beginning in the second grade, information about diverse family structures, including families with LGBT parents, to help students locate themselves in their own families in history and learn about the lives and historical struggles of their peers. So in other words, suggesting that if you, if you feel like you want to lead this lifestyle, let's talk to you about your peers throughout history. We're talking about second graders here, folks. This was according to the text of the framework. And then in grade four, now the fourth grade, as students study the history of California, they will consider the history of LGBT individuals in their state and learn about the emergence of the nation's first gay rights organizations in the 50s. Fourth grade students will also learn about Harvey Milk, a New Yorker who was elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in 77 as California's first openly gay public official in the context of immigrants who came to California from across the country and the world. Then you move on to eighth grade and they'll learn about the role of gender in history, the difference in men and women and their roles in history. And then in high school, starting and coming into the 11th grade in particular, they're slated to conduct a more drawn out study of LGBT individuals and their place in societal evolution. Among the issues to be covered in the context are LGBT oriented subcultures, homosexuals serving in the military, the pioneering role of gay politicians, and the first sex reassessment surgery. Now, they're teaching high schoolers about this. One section of the 11th grade course will focus on the emergence of the LGBT movement in the United States. And then when you get to 12th grade, they'll focus on the LGBT community again in the context of the Supreme Court cases that affected LGBT individuals. And though these additions to the California curriculum were disputed in the vote by the State Board of Education, the changes will probably become more controversial as they play out in the classroom. Now, after reading all of this, 
Folks, we're talking about the starting in the second grade and teaching these kids, seven-year-olds, about alternative lifestyles. Two mommies and two daddies, the LGBT lifestyle, all these different bisexual individuals, they're talking about teaching seventh, seven-year-olds, second graders, all the way through 12th about all these alternative lifestyles. Now, these kids are confused about what they're watching on cartoons on Saturday morning, let alone going to school in the second grade and then teaching them about alternative families, two mommies, two daddies, and this, that, and the other. I, I'm, I, I just, I can't fathom some of this stuff, but you say, well, what is it? It's the push, the LGBT agenda being pushed in America. And so they think, well, we're not getting as far enough, fast enough, trying to convert the 40, 50, 60, 70 year olds. We're probably not going to get them and win them over. So what we need to do is we need to start with the next generation. Let's start with second graders because they've decided out of thin air that a seven year old is where we need to start. And let's start teaching them about alternative families. So by the time they get out of high school, they'll think it's perfectly normal. Folks, what are we allowing to happen here in America? Well, remember what the Bible says, just as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the last days, just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. The sin of sodomy, the, a, a perverse lifestyle, alternative lifestyles was prominent, prominent, the prominent sin in the days of Lot. And Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed by God for that lifestyle. The, and the Bible says that that is going to be one of the prevalent sins in the land just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And in looking at that and what we've just talked about in starting with the second graders, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way that he, sh he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. So this verse can both be used for good and for bad. If you start indoctrinating a seven-year-old child about alternative lifestyles and that, hey, this is okay. Look at how they've come, look at how these alternative lifestyle, that people that chose to live that lifestyle throughout history have helped create America. These children will begin to look at that and think, well, hey, that's normal. And by the time they're in their teens and in their early 20s, they won't have a clue whether it's right or wrong. It's just going to seem normal for them, even though that lifestyle is diametrically opposed to the Bible. Let me say that again. That lifestyle is diametrically opposed to the Word of God. In Scripture, that lifestyle is an abomination unto God. That lifestyle is why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed by God. And so consequently, God is not pleased with that lifestyle. Can those individuals be saved? Sure they can. If they'll come out of that lifestyle and lead a godly life the rest of their lives. But these, the California has decided, well, even though it's diametrically opposed to the Bible, we're going to make it a law that they start teaching second graders on that it's really normal. What's that going to bring? It'll bring the judgments of God there. It's simply, you veer away from the Word of God, bad things happen. This law is very dangerous. We're getting to the point here in America that the LGBT lifestyle is becoming the norm for a lot of people. And because what's happening, even, even uh, in the Christian movement, another thing, another big thing will happen and we're pretty much, sometimes we'll just roll our eyes and think something else happened. We haven't really become desperate before God and said, God, please help us. We've got to stop this. Folks, listen to me. It's not the norm. The LGBT lifestyle is not the norm. It can never become a norm in our society. Now, the Bible does say it will become a norm just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ, but it doesn't have to be in America. It can be in other parts of the world, but we do not have to let our society become infected with that sin. We do not have to accept that. It is an abomination to God and we can't accept it 
in our society. It, it blows my mind. I, now, you talk about indoctrination. I know this firsthand because I'm, I'm 47 now. When I was 35, I took a couple classes in college. I needed to kind of freshen up on a few things. I went back. I took a creative writing class. It was Indiana University East in Richmond, Indiana. And this, this would be, what, 12 years ago now. And I took the creative writing class because I knew I possibly would be writing for End Time Magazine and different things in the future. I just wanted to get the kind of the juices flowing in that area. And when I went in there, they gave us writing assignments. They taught us about writing and how to, you know, put things together and all this stuff. And then they gave us writing assignments. Well, think of it like this. In this college class, over 50% of my writing assignments were on alternative families. Two mommies, two daddies. The, the LGBT movement was crammed down our throat. Now, I'm sitting there as a 35-year-old individual, a Christian, working at End Time Ministries, living for God, knowing what the Bible says about all this stuff, and I look around the class and there's all these 18, 19, 20-year-olds that are just, and just, they're just eating this up. I mean, they were, the biggest majority of the whole class was for it. Yeah, this is normal. It's a normal lifestyle. This was 12 years ago. And, of course, I kept raising my hand and the, the guy said, the, 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 um, I can't remember the professor's name. Does anybody have any questions? I raised my hand and I said, yeah, is there not anything else we can write on? This is crazy. This is indoctrination. Well, of course, it got to the point where he, he, he hated to call on me. He would look at me and say, Mr. Robbins? Because he knew I was totally 100% diametrically opposed to this. Well, of course, I did the assignments in the opposing view. I was not going to write it like he wanted. I did get an A in the class. But before the class was over, we were there. I think we were the last couple classes. And he made the statement that, now this is a, a creative writing class. The professor made the, made the statement that it's scientifically proven that there is a gay gene that a male has that only a female has that could, uh, that makes him attractive to a, another male. Well, of course, I knew that was totally false. I raised my hand and I said, whoa, 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 hold on. You mean you're telling me that you know 100% that it's scientifically proven that a gay male has a gay gene that is, it's scientifically proven that that's the case. He said, oh yeah, it's scientifically proven. All these kids in the class are eating it up. I said, I don't, I don't believe that. So what I did in my last paper, I went and got all this documentation and I actually did two papers at the end. One paper was proving the fact that it's never been scientifically proven that there's a gay gene. And I just read an article before I walked in here. I won't have time to go over it on today's program. You can go to um, CNS News uh, and read the article if you want to. Uh, it's, a, it's a doctor that worked with, at the Johns Hopkins um, Hospital, and he said that it's never been proven. It's not, it's, there's no such thing as a gay gene. And so consequently, I gave this professor all this documentation and turned my paper in. Well, when it came back, I got an A on the paper that I'd written on the other subject. And then it, he had never, it didn't look like he'd ever even touched the paper on the left-hand side. However, what I was doing, I was pushing back against this LGBT agenda that was being pushed in my classroom 12 years ago. Now, if that was 12 years ago, how do you think it is now after the Supreme Court has legalized same-sex marriage in all 50 states. How do you think it is now? That was 12 years ago. How do you think it is now when all of these other different things, the don't ask, don't tell, the uh, DOMA has been repealed, all these different things are happening. President Obama, the most LGBT-friendly president in the history of the United States, he's been in office for the last seven and a half years. He wasn't even in office when I went to college. And so consequently, it's very, very important that we look at it. The Bible says 
that the sin of uh, the LGBT movement would be pushed in the last days. That's basically what it's saying in Luke. As in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, as in the days when Lot come up out of Sodom, it's going to be just like that, just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I've actually seen that indoctrination of students in a classroom myself. I was involved in it. And then when I read this, I thought, hold on a minute. I was a 35-year-old Christian male, and I pushed back against that in my class. What is a second grader going to do? They're totally vulnerable. They're trying to decide who's going to be able to pick the teams at recess. They're not concerned about all this stuff, but yet this LGBT community and those that are behind it are pushing it so hard that they're going to take vulnerable second, third, fourth, fifth, even all the way through 12th graders and say, we're going to indoctrinate these individuals because they're the next generation that's coming. And it's been passed in California. Let me ask you a question. Do you think it's going to stay in California? Many of you are probably in states where they probably have already talked about it. They're thinking about it. And so if you come across a vote like that, what will you do? Will you stand in front of a, a school board and talk against it? Will you push back against that? The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You need to pray for your school boards to make sure that they do not accept this because this will bring the judgments of God here and we do not want that. It brought the judgments of God on Sodom and Gomorrah and we're watching it being pushed here in the United States of America and we cannot stand for it as Christians, as business, as leaders in our community. We can't stand for it. Let's push back against it because we do not want that in the United States of America. God bless America, everybody. Taking the train home from work today? How about taking one of our video lessons along for the ride on your mobile device? Download lessons to watch at your convenience, like the End Time University semesters, designed to take you down the path to spiritual maturity. Wherever your ride may take you today, you can take End Time University along the way. You can also download the companion study workbooks. Easily refer to these on your mobile device to review key points in each lesson. Then take a quiz and check your answers at the end. Who knew the train would be such a great place to do an end time Bible study? Go to endtime.com slash door and click downloads to find many video lessons and PDF workbooks. Jesus said that there would be a particular generation that would see specific things take place. And this would be the people that would see his second coming to the earth. The big question is, can we know this generation? Jesus talked about it in Matthew 24. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and put out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. In the DVD, This Generation Shall Not Pass, Irvin discusses the events that must occur that will let us know the generation that shall not pass until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Get this enlightening lesson by calling 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. If your radio station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com to continue to listen to today's broadcast. Well, welcome back, everybody. And I know I'm talking about a, um, a very critical subject today. And it gets, it gets very serious to a lot of us because those of us that follow the Bible and want to live by its principles, and though the, those of us that follow prophecy and understand the prophecies of the Bible, number one, we know that we're just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ because of the prophecy tells us that just as it was at when Lot come up out of Sodom, it's going to be the same way. The same sin would be prevalent in the land just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So it's important that we understand how much that sin is being pushed here in the United States. 
It's very, very important that we understand that. And we don't want our society to morally decay. And we're in the process of doing that. The more this stuff is pushed and the more ground they gain and the less we lose, we're talking about moral decay here in the United States. We can't have that. We can't continue to let this occur in the United States of America. And it's happening in big waves. It's not, it, early on it was real little small things. But now it's like these big waves of stuff. And I'm, I'm going to go over some of those here in a minute. The next one I want to talk about is the U.S. military lifts the ban on transgenders serving openly in the military. This comes from Fox News. It says that transgender people will be allowed, now totally alternative lifestyle. Everybody knows transgender, what that's all about. I don't have to go into all that and explain the whole thing. Transgender people will be allowed to serve openly in the U.S. military, according to the, the Pentagon announced on June 30th. And it's ending one of the last bans on service in the armed forces. Saying that, they, they went on to say that it's the right thing to do. This is from uh, Defense Secretary Ash Carter. He laid out a year-long implementation plan declaring that Americans who want to serve and can meet our standards should be afforded the opportunity to compete and do so. Under the new policy, by October 1st, just coming up here in a couple months, Transgender troops already serving should be able to receive medical care and begin formally changing their gender identifications in the Pentagon's personnel system. Under the new policy, transgender troops would receive any medically necessary care, including surgery. Are they talking about the transitional surgery? Would the taxpayers have to pay for that? I don't think I should have to pay for that, do you? The policy provides broad guidelines for transgender service members currently in the military. They will be able to use the bathrooms, housing, uniforms, and fitness standards of their preferred gender only after they have legally transitioned to that identity, according to the officials. They're gonna be able to use Females' bathrooms and locker rooms and different things, folks. I, I this, I'm almost beside myself. I'm doing cartwheels inside, and you can't really tell listening to me on the radio because this has gotten so far out of hand. It's it's not really laughable, but I, I, I have to almost laugh to keep from getting so mad I can't move, and I got steam coming out of my ears because they're going to allow men. Imagine being a 21, 22, 23-year-old man deciding that you're a female. Your hormones are so far out of whack, it's not even funny at that point in your life. And you think, hey, I can shower with all the females. So I'm, you know what? I feel like a woman. I'm going to legally transition to that, and I'm going to be able to go share Ladies' locker rooms and go to the bathrooms with them and all this stuff. Folks, and this is what they're doing in the United States military. I, I, I just, some of this stuff is, is so beyond me, I, I, don't, I can't even comprehend it. The article goes on to say, with transgender military, with the ban lifted, Obama cements, uh, this is, well, the next article. With the transgender military ban lifted, the Obama cements the historic LGBT, LGBT rights legacy. So, like I said before, it comes from the NBC News. President Obama is the most LGBT-friendly president we've ever had by, by leaps and bounds. The article says that the Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, announced an end to the military's long-standing ban on openly transgender service members on June 30, fulfilling a key piece, and get this, fulfilling a key piece of the Obama administration's historic legacy on the LGBT rights. So we're talking about the top echelon in America right now. The president, the president of the United States and his administration. It's one of, he, he's trying to complete a legacy of LGD, LGBT rights while he's, in, while he's in office. And President Obama's historic steps, or in some cases, shoves toward fuller LGBT equality in America 
have been well documented. Most everybody, probably everybody listening to me on the radio has lived through the implementation of some unbelievable LGBT moves here in the United States. 1960, it was a criminal act to commit the act of sodomy. 2015, the Supreme Court passes a law legalizing same-sex marriage in all 50 states in the United States of America. We've all lived through that. And so consequently, some of these things, are they well documented? Absolutely. We live through them. They're ranging from symbolic nods of approval to concrete and transformative policy prescriptions. Now, folks, remember Luke 17, 29 through 30. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. I just told you in 1960, it was illegal in the United States, all 50 states, to commit the act of sodomy. In 2000, so at, back then, could you have said that it was the same now as it was in the days of Lot? No, it was an illegal act. So we weren't, could we say we were in the end times at that point? We were very, 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 very close. Things were starting to happen. Israel came back together. But could we say we're just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ? Probably not 60 in 1960. Jump forward to today and I want you to listen at what President Obama has done over the last seven and one half years to promote the LGBT agenda in America. In 2009, he signed into law the first federal protections based on gender identity or sexual orientation with the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. One year later, he enacted a measure repealing the military's ban on openly gay service members. Of course, it was known as Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Repealed it. President Obama's administration's abandonment of the now defunct Defense of Marriage Act, which stated that marriage was between a man and a woman, one man, one woman, um, and it excluded same-sex couples from federal benefits, an executive order barring federal contractors, also an executive order um, barring, fe barring federal contractors from discriminating on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, also the legalization of marriage equality across the country, and now, now those are huge. Each one of those are huge steps, and not everything's in that list. But now, of course, the department's zero tolerance approach to state-sponsored discrimination against transgender individuals. And we've also seen, like I said, in 2015, the Supreme Court legalizing same-sex marriage in all 50 states. It was a criminal act in 1960. Now, under the Obama administration, the Supreme Court legalized it in all 50 states. Just, I'm talking about huge waves of things just being knocked down. These are not little dominoes. These are huge surf waves coming at the beach. Totally different. I mean, these are huge. And the moral decline of America just goes down, down, down. It's a huge spiral. Well, the ultimate LGBT equality to-do list on Obama, of the Obama administration is not yet complete. Passing federal non-discrimination protections, for example, that remains outstanding. But short of a miracle in Congress that would somehow com how compel enough of its members to take up the Equality Act, ending the military's ban on transgender troops will likely be the ma last major accomplishment of Obama's LGBT rights record. So let me ask you a question right here at this point. In looking forward, you say, man, he, that guy's done a lot. I mean, he's been totally LGBT friendly, President of the United States. Look at all the stuff that's fallen that he's just ramrodded through since he's been in office. Okay, looking at the next two candidates, ask yourself, do I want to go down the same roads I've been going down for the next four, possibly eight years? Or do I want something different? You have to ask yourself that question. Because 
We got, we've got to change this at some point. Something has to snap us out of this so that way we don't continue down this road. We continue down this road, this nation is going to disintegrate. Now, I don't see that happening in the future, so God's got something in store. We've been praying and fasting around here for years for a change in this nation. And I know pastors all, not just us here at End Time, I know pastors all over the nation have been, and, and, and more, the churches have been praying for a change in our nation. I see that coming. But we've got to do something to change. One of the things we can do to change that is be educated and be prayerful in your decision on who to vote for in this upcoming election. Very, very, very important. That's why I said at the beginning of the program, go read the Democratic platform and go read. They have a draft out. It came out July 1. And they're gonna, there's going to be a final draft that's given at the convention on what their platform is. But you can go read the draft. Look it up on the Internet, on Google. Google is our friend at this point. The, Democrat, the Democratic platform and the Republican pl platform. Go read those platforms. Look at their issues and see, do I want this person? Am I going to be going down the same road or worse for the next four to eight years? Or am I going to change this and get somebody in there who'll do something to change it? You got, it's, narrow, it's narrowed down to two people at this point, folks. And so that's what we've got to look at here in the near future. The next presidential election is so critical because there's so many things weighing in the balance. LGBT movement. Do we want to push that or do we want to pull away from that and support marriage between one man and one woman that's defined in, by God in the Bible in the beginning of the book of Genesis? Marriage was defined by God. Now, I'd love to go in and teach this to the second graders in California and the high schoolers and the middle schoolers. Marriage was defined by God in the book of Genesis as between one man, one woman, period. Not two men, not two women. The Bible calls that those institutions an abomination to God. Plain and simple. You say, well, hold on, Dave, you're, 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 a, um, you're a homosexuality basher, homosexual basher. No, I'm not. I'm, in, in talking about this, I'm hoping, and I've had people in the past that have been saved out of that lifestyle and come to us and said, thank you guys for telling me the truth. And so consequently, the Bible says that individual can be saved, but you have to tell somebody the truth. If you love them, at the risk of offending them, you have to tell them the truth. What an incredibly important subject we have today. Islam in Bible prophecy. It hasn't been many years since those planes flew into the trade towers in New York City and suddenly the attention of the world was riveted on this religion, Islam, that very few of us knew very much about. But if you had to guess the religion of a suicide bomber, what religion would you guess? Now, could this religion, this huge religion, be totally absent from the prophecies of the Bible? We're going to find out today. It's not true. Islam is in your Bible. To order our DVDs, Islam in Bible Prophecy, and Will Islam Rule the World, call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. Welcome back, everybody. We're talking about a very critical subject today, the push of LGBT rights in America today. And I just talked to you about lifting the ban on transgenders serving in the military. It's an LGBT push, a huge one, wall that's been knocked down here in the United States of America, in our military. You say, well, how in the world can this happen, Dave? Well, in short, People in influential positions started acting on what they feel and not what is right. They started veering away from the biblical teaching of how a life should be lived and how a union 
of one man and one woman was instituted by God from the very beginning, and it started the moral decline here in America. So let's look at the military real quick. In 1982, a defense directive from Ronald Reagan stated that homosexuality is incompatible with military service. And people who are engaged in homosexual acts or stated that they were homosexual or bisexual were discharged from the military. Now, I don't mean, I'm not into hurting people, but I agree with Ronald Reagan's stance. In 1992, President, presidential candidate Bill Clinton, whose wife is running for, for the president this time, obviously most of you know that, he promised to lift that ban that Ronald Reagan instituted. In 1993, the Don't Ask, Don't Tell law, which became official U.S. policy regarding the service of homosexual in the military, was signed by Bill Clinton directing that the military personnel don't ask, don't tell, don't pursue, and don't harass. When it went into effect on October 1st, 1993, the policy theoretically lifted a ban on homosexual service that had been instituted all the way back during the days of World War II. That happened under Clinton. In 2008, while running for president, one of Barack Obama's campaign promises was full repeal of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell. In December of 2010, President Barack Obama signed the legislation to end Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and the policy officially ended on September 20, 2011. So can you see the downward spiral? Pre Ronald Reagan, President Reagan said, homosexual, the alternative lifestyles, all these different things, they have no place serving in our military. We don't want that. We don't want men with men, women with women. And it just, it breaks down the whole thing of what the military is trying to do. They've got to be focused. And he says they don't have any part in that. Well, then through President Clinton and President Obama, there's been a huge moral decay in our, de decay in our country. And now, as of June 30th, 2016, transgender individuals or those who simply feel that they are different gender than what's stated on their birth certificate, they're allowed to openly serve in the military. Now, folks, I have to ask a question. What are we doing? Our leaders have completely went away from the direction that our founding fathers intended. The original 13 colonies reflected a respect for biblical principles by enacting laws against homosexual acts. All the way at the founding of our country, several of the colonies actually referred to the Bible's teaching on homosexuality in Leviticus 20:13 when adopting these anti-sodomy laws. Leviticus 20:13 states, "If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination." and they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. These sodomy laws that were enacted early on by the original 13 colonies, they continued all the way through and were embraced by all 50 states of the United States, like I said before, up until 1960. Up until 1960, I can't say this enough. Up until 1960, from the original 13 colonies until 1960, it was a criminal act in the United States to commit the act of sodomy. And of course, as of last year, the Supreme Court, with the ruling of a five to four, one person legalized same-sex marriage in all 50 states in the United States of America. And remember Luke. The verse in Luke says, just as it was, in the days that Lot come up out of Sodom, so shall it be in the, in the last days just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So understanding the indispensable role that God must play in America's form of government, it becomes clear why the collapse of American morality began in 1960. All we, do, all we need to do now is investigate the events that began at that time. 1961, the U.S. Supreme Court overruled a provision of Maryland Constitution which made a declaration of belief in the existence of God mandatory for holding a public office. Now, after that, after 1961, you can hold a public office 
You don't even necessarily need to believe in a God. In the United States of America, in 1962, of course, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that prayer in schools was unconstitutional. Prayer in schools. Do you think there are people in California today that would like to have prayer back in schools? If we had prayer in schools, I can tell you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, these laws in California would not be getting passed. The Bible says, where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. And when you resist against Satan, the Bible says he will flee. So prayer changes things. Prayer could change what's going on in California right now. People have to get serious and pray about it. Prayer works. One of these days I may do a program on the prayers that I've known God has answered in my life and in different people's lives here at End Time Ministries and people I know. Believe me, folks, prayer works. Prayer is the most powerful tool we have against all this mess going on in our society. Prayer. And so prayer works. But they put the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional. 1961, we began a huge moral decline here in America to the point where pretty much anything goes almost nowadays. They're trying to get men to go in and use the restrooms with women and go in their locker rooms and go in the shower rooms and all these different things in our military. And I'm scratching my head going, you've got to be kidding me. Why? Because decisions were made decades ago that started pulling God out of our society and started pushing our society away from the biblical principles that this nation was built upon. And what happens when you pull away from the word of God? You have no moral compass. What's your moral compass based on? It's based on what you feel, your desires, your own lusts. And so there's no guidelines. I've had people tell me in the past, oh, the Bible, that's just a, that's rules and regulations. I, you know, I don't want anything to do with that. It's not rules and regulations. It's boundaries that protect you. It's not things that, well, if I want to live by the word of God, I can't do this and I can't do this and I can't do this. No, 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 no. You're looking at it all wrong. The word of God is boundaries that protect you. You step outside those boundaries and the wolves are waiting out there for you. And that's what's happened. A lot of our leaders and these people have stepped outside the boundaries of the word of God. And there's wolves waiting out there that are that are waiting to destroy them. The number one wolf is Satan. Satan is behind all of this. When God established marriage between a man and a woman early on, Satan said, I'm going to pervert that. And he's been working ever since to pervert what God set in place 6,000 years ago. At the very beginning, God established marriage, a marriage between a male, and one male and one female. And Satan said, I'm going to pervert that. I'm going to make it between two males and two females. Because God hates that. And it makes Satan so happy he can't see straight. He just sits back and laughs. And that's what happens when you step outside the boundaries of the word of God. And that's what we're seeing happening here in the United States. Early in the 60s, they made rulings where, yes, you can hold a public office. The ones in a public office are making the decisions if you didn't know that. That's why we need to vote in the people that we want to make the right decisions. They allowed people to get in a public office who didn't necessarily even believe in a God. That happened in the early 60s. And also in the early 60s, they took prayer out of the schools. So in going in and every morning before you start school and someone saying a prayer and ask God to have his hands upon them students and help them learn the right things and live for God, they pulled that out. And now we've got all kinds of debauchery in our schools. Why? Because we stepped outside the boundaries of the word of God. The word of God is not rules and restrictions and regulations on somebody to put them in a box. The word of God is a protective, safe haven for an individual. And it will protect you from all of the fiery darts of the wicked, Satan. 
You live inside those boundaries and you're protected from Satan. Get outside those boundaries and you're fair game. And that's what's happened in the United States of America. We've stepped outside of those boundaries and look at what's happening. When, when you get outside the boundaries, no more moral compass. There's nothing to base your moral compass on. You stepped outside the word of God. So now it's, hey, whatever I feel goes. That's the normal. That's what's going to happen in society is whatever I feel. One of our biggest problems in society is people are doing, they're basing their actions on just their feelings. And Satan is always going to give you a feeling. And if you're outside the boundaries of the Word of God, it's probably going to be contrary to the Word of God. There's no moral compass. What do you base your moral compass on? So you, if, if you're asking yourself, Dave, or asking me, whoever, Dave, how's all this stuff happening in the United States of America? We started out on biblical foundational principles and for, for over, way over almost 200 years, 184 years, we held strong. How do we get to the point where we would pass laws that we would teach second graders that alternative lifestyles that are diametrically opposed to the Word of God that were against the law all the way up till 1960 in this country, how do we get to the point where we would start teaching seven-year-olds that it's okay? Now, let's pull the Word of God out of school and let's put this, these teachings that are diametrically opposed to the Word of God in school. You see what I'm saying? The moral compass gets thrown in the trash. And now it's whatever I feel, that's what we're going to push. No. Listen, listen, everyone, please. Can we turn this around? Yes, we can. I, I wanted to bring this before you today because there's so much going on that lets us know we're in the end time and how desperate of a situation that we are in. The, the, presidential, the, the presidential election coming up, very, very critical. Probably the most critical ever in the history of this nation. I want to know what the, the candidates believe in and I want to vote for the right one. And then we can also turn it around by prayer and fasting. Get on your knees. Cry out to God. Get desperate. Ask God to heal our nation. Remember, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. You do that on your knees in prayer and in fasting and, and cry out to God and ask him to heal our land. Because I'm telling you right now, we're very wounded. We need a healing from God. We need revival, a spiritual revival in these last days. End of the Age is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom. <laughs>